morning, Team Radiant. Man, I'm so glad that you're here. It's been interesting watching uh, as the death of Kobe Bryant here in the last few weeks really caught the culture's attention, really, really kind of stopped everyone in their, track, in their tracks. It was, it was a shocking moment, and why not? He was a man of influence, a, a man of our culture, perhaps one of the greatest, well, he was one of the greatest basketball players of all time and inspired countless number of athletes and, and young men and women to just love the game and to just love sports and be more. And, and so it really kind of shocked everyone when it happened. And that, that's what happened. Shocking events do that. They stop us in our tracks and they make us ask questions. Let me ask, though, this big question. Do you remember where you were when it happened? Do you remember what you were doing at the time when the story broke about the crash of the helicopter? I, I do. Sometimes in these events, we remember things like that. But let's go backwards a little bit for some of us who are, who are older. How about 9-11? Do you remember where you were when the story broke on the airplanes going into the, the two towers? When you heard that we were under attack, do you remember what you were doing at the time? Life has those moments. We go backwards. How about when Princess Diana's car crashed? Do you remember what was going on at that time? There's all sorts of events like that in our lives, whether that's the Berlin Wall falling. Maybe, maybe you remember uh, President Reagan being shot. We go back, some of you who are even more mature, maybe remember some of those bigger events like the moon landing or the shooting of Dr. Martin Luther King. These events, they leave in us a vivid memory oftentimes of where we were, what we were doing, and even how it affected the culture and the world around us because they were powerful emotional events. The reality is all of us have these sorts of events in our lives. They may not be ones that affect the entire culture and everyone around us, but all of us have memories. All of us have events that happen in our lives that we don't easily forget. They can be happy events that, that leave on us just a feeling of joy and we remember them fondly, but they can also be painful and all too often is those events in our lives that are hurtful that leave scars in our lives. We don't easily forget these sorts of things. These are the moments in our lives that shape our memories. And, and if we think about it, for those of you who can remember the attacks on 9-11, let me ask you this question. Do you remember what you were doing on August 11th of that year? Do you, do you remember what was going on on August 11th, 2001? I don't, maybe you do, but I'm guessing for the vast majority of us here, we don't have a memory of that day. But most of us remember September 11th very clearly. Why? Because it's true in our life, it's true in the culture. We typically retain the information and the memories that have strong feelings attached to them. Those are the ones we remember and don't forget so easily. And just like there are some in our culture that we all remember collectively, there are those memories in our lives that have those strong feelings and emotions attached to them as well. So I take a step back and, and, and want to talk a little bit about an exercise I do oftentimes with leaders. And you might be asking, gee, it seems like we talk about in this series a lot about exercises that, that you do with your leaders. And the reality is this, this series aligns very well with developing leaders because what I have learned is you cannot have emotionally and spiritually immature leaders. If you're going to have true leaders in the church, they need to be both emotionally and spiritually mature. So a lot of these things we're talking about in this series and that you're getting caught up are things that are part of leadership development with people around me. One of those exercises I've done, maybe you've done an exercise like this, is to hand those leaders 10 to 15 note cards. And I will tell them, listen, I want you to go home this week, and I want you to think through your life from the day you were born and all the way up to now, and I want you to put on these note cards one impactful event, a defining moment in your life, an event that truly changed your life, set you off on a different course, or maybe it's a very joyful, happy event that, that you truly remember this was an amazing time in our lives. But I don't want there to be more than 15. I don't want there to be less than 10. Go home, really think through these, and bring them back the next week. And when they come back, we'll have them describe what those events are. If you're mentoring somebody, this could be an amazing group exercise, too, if you're a group leader. Or maybe this is something you can even use in the workplace as you lead other people. This is a great way as they share 
what some of those defining moments look like in their lives. You learn a little bit more about them, but you also learn a little bit about what has defined them. What are some of those things that have truly impacted them in their lives? And it can lead to questions later like, how did that impact you? Why did it impact you? And how did you move past it? Or how did you take next steps beyond that? So I encourage you to do that exercise. It's a great exercise because what we realize is all of us have defining moments in our lives. Whether whether these moments are good or whether these moments are bad, all of us have these moments in our lives that leave us with lasting memories, lasting experiences that aren't so easy to forget. And we need to talk through and work through them. And so today I'm just going to open with this, and it's your first fill-in if you're going to follow along in the notes on the back of your teaching guide today. And it seems probably common sense, but this is an important thing to just set the foundation on as we talk today. To become spiritually healthy, you must let go of the past. I'm just going to throw it out there. To become spiritually healthy, to become emotionally healthy, really, at that level as well, you're going to have to let go of the past. Now, I didn't say you have to forget the past. I didn't say pretend the past isn't there or just ignore it. That's not what we're saying here. What I say is you have to let go of the past. You've got to let it go. And right now, if you're singing the theme song to that Disney movie, you are welcome. That's my gift to you today. Ha <laughs> But we have to let it go. The next thing is we begin to build our case today, and this is important. The events of our past exist in our memories. Why do I say that? Well, our brain is like a computer, and it records those events. And as they happen, the the brain stores them somewhere. It remembers them somewhere. But here's the important part we need to know about this. Events by themselves are neutral. Hang with me now. I am getting somewhere with this. What do you mean by that, Jason? Events are neutral. It is you and I. It is us that assigns value to the events. If we think that event that happened was beneficial to us, then we say this was a happy event. This was a good event. It is us who assigns that value. If we believe that event was hurtful to us or harmed us, we will then label that event as bad, that it was not good for us. So events in and of themselves are neutral. It is us who places value on each of those events, and we gauge them as to whether or not we think that they are beneficial or they are harmful in our lives. And so as we keep going, what we, what we realize then is just because events themselves are neutral and we can't do anything about that, we've got to realize we can't change our memories of events. Again, they happened, we experienced them, Our brains recorded them. Our brains are our computer, and so they store them. They happen. We can't change whether or not things happen, whether it's good or bad. We can't change that it did happen. But here's the big piece we have to realize today. We can change our perspective of them. Remember, we're the ones who assign value to them. We assign a value of this is beneficial or this is harmful to us. And so while we can't change the events in our lives, they happen whether we want them to or not, we can choose over time to change our perspective of how we see them. We have to make a choice at some part, some point in this process to say this thing is either an obstacle or it is an op- opportunity. We have to work through that. This thing that, that happened to me, this thing that I went through, Was this thing an opportunity of which now I can find new avenues of growth? I may not have liked it. I get it. But am I going to view this thing as an opportunity in which I can grow? I can become a better person? I can be changed to be more like Jesus? Or is this going to be an obstacle in my life that stops me dead in my tracks, doesn't allow me to grow, doesn't allow me to move on, and I just stay stuck where I'm at? It's us that has to look at those situations and make that decision. Am I going to see this thing as an opportunity or am I going to see this as an obstacle, particularly the bad things in our lives? What am I going to do this thing? In fact, we have to 
ask the bigger question, and that question is this, can difficult events in our lives be necessary for personal growth? Do we sometimes have to walk through negative events in our lives in order to grow? Doesn't mean we like it. Certainly doesn't mean we enjoyed it in the midst of it. May have left left us with a lot of questions like, why, oh, why, Lord? Or how come this happened to me? But what we have to wrestle with today, if we're going to look at it as this is, is this an opportunity or is this an obstacle, is we've got to ask our question, is it a reality that a difficult events are actually necessary for my personal growth sometimes? And I've learned in my life that they absolutely are necessary sometimes if you're going to grow, if you're going to break through. Remember we said growth oftentimes is being stretched, it's being pulled in order to break through barriers You've got to look in your life and say, are there some hurts? Are there some angers? Are there some emotions? Are there some pains in my life that are keeping me from growing both emotionally and spiritually? And how do I look at those things? How am I viewing them? What kind of value have I placed on them? Today, I just want to look at a couple different passages in the scripture. The goal today is for you to ask those questions necessarily always answer them are there areas in your lives that you need to relook at rethink is this an obstacle or is this an opportunity for me to grow and how have i been looking at this am i growing or am i stuck somewhere in my spiritual journey that's mainly what we're going to try to do today so i want to look at a couple verses that will challenge us the first one is from jesus himself and in that verse we see it in luke chapter 9 In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus says this. He says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Strong words. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Now, we've talked about this verse uh, a year or so ago before, but it's worth mentioning again because it's such a powerful, important verse. It's a farming analogy that Jesus is giving here. You see, in the old days, long before you could buy a million-dollar GPS tractor from John Deere, you had to do it by hand. And in order to plow a straight line, a farmer would put a marker, a post, out at the end of the field. And as he plowed behind the animals, he would keep his eyes squarely on that marker. No matter what, you didn't look to the side, you didn't look behind you, you kept your eyes on that marker. Why? Because if you took your eyes off and you keep taking your eyes off, you're going to swerve. You're going to turn. You're not going to plow a straight line. And that's the story that Jesus is telling here. He's, listen, he's saying, you've got to keep your eyes on the kingdom. You've got to keep your eyes forward on the marker. You can't be a part of the kingdom of God. You're not fit to serve in the kingdom of God. If you're spending your entire life looking backwards, looking at the past, getting stuck in the past, you got to move on. you got to look forward. That's the challenge that Jesus was calling us to. Now, there's a second set of passages I want to look at today, but before we get into those passages from Paul, I need to really take a step back and just walk you through another piece of leadership development, another thing I walk through the leaders on my team through, but I think it's important for us to get on the same page and have that understanding. Sometimes people will ask me, what does the spiritual journey look like? What does it look like as people move from making a decision or or maybe not even caring at all about God and church and things? What does it look like as they move through the Christian journey? And and what what does maturity look like? They, They ask me questions like that, and they're great questions. And the answer is it can look different for everybody. But I've noticed there's at least four stages that people tend to walk through. Four stages that are common oftentimes in our spiritual journey, and these are important for us to understand and ask ourselves, where am I on this journey? Because we're going to find out along that journey, there's places to get stuck as well, too. And so what do these four areas look like? First, I want to acknowledge that very easily you could tell me there's five areas. Off to the side here, off of the screen, is an area called, I don't care about God, I don't care about Jesus, could care less about church, don't have any questions, I'm doing fine, leave me alone. Okay? 
and maybe you're here. Welcome. We're glad you're here, but I acknowledge that. This is what does that Christian journey look like. And so what we notice is in a Christian journey, someone starts first by exploring. And what do we mean by exploring? It means, hey, something's awakened inside of them. They begin to ask questions. Curious. Who am I? Why do we exist? Where did this all come from? Do I have meaning? Do I have purpose? A lot of those questions start to come in, and they're amazing, good questions. And if that's where you're at, man, I'm glad you're here. Feel free to ask those questions. We'll try to answer them the best we can. Just know that all of us have been at a point like this before where we're just asking questions. We're exploring. We're trying to learn more. Haven't made a decision yet. Not ready to commit. Not all in. But man, I've got questions. Awesome. Often many of that group then will begin to take on what they've learned to to consider it, and they'll take a step of believing. For a lot of you, you you can remember a time in your life where maybe you said a prayer. Maybe you cried out to God and said, you know, dear God, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. I want to be in eternity with you. It's, It's a point of salvation. And you've got that that time when you can say, yes, I clearly crossed the line. I clearly said, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on a cross for me. If you've done that, that's amazing. A lot of Christians have, and that's a starting point. All too often, though, we have presented it, and I don't mean here at Radiant, I mean the church in general. Oftentimes, we present this as an ending point, and it leaves some questions. It's like, hey, say a prayer and go to heaven, and we're like, okay, now what? I mean, are we just hanging out and just waiting until Jesus comes back or we die? What's going on from that? And too many Christians, we're going to find out, can get stuck here. For those, though, who wrestle with believing and what they believe and why they believe it, there is a natural next step. It's one that I've had in my life. John Wesley, a, a famous evangelist, also had this moment in his life. He was a pastor, but there was the second time where his heart was deeply warmed, and, and, he, and he came to realize there was another step he needed to take in his Christian journey. There was a time for me as well, too, and that's when we move from believing into surrendering, and they're two different things. See, in one, we say Jesus is my Savior, and we'll get to this in a minute. In the other one, Jesus is our King. And for those who surrender and work through surrender, the next step after that is they begin to realize more and more they exist to multiply. That the reason we are on this Christian journey is to make more disciples. Jesus told us to go out to the world and make more disciples. And so a person, as they mature and they grow in the relationship with Jesus Christ, begin to realize more and more that the purpose and the existence of Christianity and why they have been called to be a part of the kingdom of God and to be a part of Christ's church is that we all, every single one of us, exist to multiply and make more disciples, leaders, and churches. That is the calling of the Bible. That's what the entire New Testament's about. That's what the entire book of Acts is about as you dive into that. And so this is the journey that a lot of Christians have to walk through. They go from exploring to believing to surrendering to multiplying. Now, churches and people who like to count things and poll things over the past 10, 15 years have really been kind of watching this sort of thing. They may use a few different words, but they've kind of been watching this reality, particularly between believing and surrendering. And what we've come to realize over the last 10 years or so is that the vast majority of Christians get stuck somewhere between believing and surrendering. In fact, the number as they polled tens of thousands of people is around 80%. About 80% of all Christians in America get stuck somewhere oftentimes between this believing and surrendering. And again, it's a lot of different things. One, it's partially because in some circles they presented the gospel as say a prayer, go to heaven, you're done. You've arrived. And unfortunately, there's an entire process in our lives that we realize that just because you said a prayer and you say, I believe in Jesus, doesn't mean a magic wand got waved and all of your past hurts, your pains, your failures, everything you've dealt with just magically disappears. What we realize, no, there's this process that we have to go through as we grow, as we become disciples of Jesus. There's a process of constant surrendering in our lives that must happen. We surrender our agendas. We surrender our goals. We surrender our things. We surrender our money. And we surrender our pains and our hurts and our failures. 
It's a constant death and resurrection in our life. There's lots of things in our lives that we have to surrender, and Christians constantly have to wrestle with this reality that I have to surrender something to the Lordship of Jesus. And that's the big difference when you ask between someone who says, I believe and I am surrendered. I will tell you the biggest purpose is this, is for those who believe Jesus is their Savior, but for those who have surrendered, Jesus is their King. And there's a lot of Christians sitting out there that say, listen, Jesus is my Savior. I love this forgiveness stuff i love this eternal life stuff man sign me up for that but i don't need a king i don't need someone calling the shots in my lives and i'm doing just fine with my plans my agendas and my stuff i don't need to surrender anything i believe and a lot of Christians are stuck between that believing and surrendering. And they're not experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They're not growing spiritually and emotionally in their lives. They're stuck. And maybe you're there. Because a lot of times what I'll hear from Christians is, is they'll say just that. They're like, I feel like I've plateaued. I feel like I'm just kind of stuck in my journey. It doesn't feel like I'm growing. And one of my first questions, they don't always love it, is then what aren't you surrendering? What haven't you given to God? What are you holding on to that doesn't belong to you? What do you got to give up? So many Christians are stuck in this middle area. And one of the biggest attitudes we have to change, particularly in the American church, I'm going to be tough here, is you got to move from feed me to feed others. In other words, you got to move from the church exists to feed me, the church exists to grow me. It certainly has a role in that, but your final purpose isn't to land on that idea. Can you see how that's consumerism? Can you see how when your entire church journey is one about what are you going to do for me? It will land you into a consumer mindset. What would happen like Jesus when he talked to Peter and he said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep? What happens when we understand that it's not that the church exists for us, it certainly is something we're part of and we certainly should be fed, but what happens when we also take on the mindset that says, but I exist for God and others. I exist, exist to give this away. The problem is, is we can get stuck there and we have to be really careful. I show you this so that when we walk into this next passage from Paul in Philippians, maybe it'll help us understand. In Philippians chapter 3, here's what Paul has to say. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. In other words, like that picture, and you ask yourself, where are you in that journey? Paul's basically saying, I haven't arrived either. I haven't achieved perfection either. I haven't, I haven't gotten there either. Which is hard, because when you start thinking about it, you're like, well, this is the guy that planted countless numbers of churches all over the Roman uh, Empire and, and trained up untold numbers of leaders. This is the guy that wrote half the New Testament and, and, and went out there and brought the gospel to the Gentiles. And if he hasn't arrived, probably good chance we haven't either. Amen? He's like, I haven't obtained all this. I haven't arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to take in hold of it. But notice what he says next. But one thing I do. Pay attention. If you don't pay attention to anything else today, pay attention to this. One thing I do. Forgetting what is behind me and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now first we need to take a look at that word forgetting because there's a very unique Greek word used here and forgetting in the ancient Greek doesn't mean what it means in the modern English. There's a slight difference. When we talk about forgetting in the ancient Greek, what we're talking about is not caring about any longer. In other words, no longer caring for. So now we can understand even more what Paul's saying. He says, the one thing I do, no longer caring for what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Again, you can't forget in the sense of, hey, it didn't happen and, and I blotted it out of my mind. It's there. Our mind recorded it, we experienced, we walked through it. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's saying about forgetting, he's saying, I no longer care for it. This thing no longer identifies me. This no, no longer defines me. I'm not going to be stuck in this thing. 
no longer caring for, I'm going to move on and I'm going to keep my eye on the goal. But now we have to wrestle with, thinking back to that, that diagram I gave you, what's your goal? Do you have a goal? Do you see it as Paul did? Because he had a clear goal. No matter where Paul went, he was going to introduce people to Jesus. He was going to make disciples. He was passionate about it. He went everywhere spreading the gospel and telling as many people about Jesus as he could. And let me ask, is that your goal? Do you have in you the goal to multiply, to make more disciples? Do you keep focused on that goal? Paul was radically focused on that. He stayed focused on that. Why? Because you have to ask yourself, did, did things always go well for Paul? Uh-uh. This is a man who got stoned, beaten, throwing, thrown in jail, kicked out of towns wherever he went. He had lots of reasons to give up. But this is a man that was so clear on his goal and his focus and his sense of purpose that even in the bad times, he was focused to moving forward. He kept his eyes on the goal, on the finish line, and where he was going. Do you have a goal? Do you have a sense of purpose? Do you understand, like Paul, you exist to introduce people to Jesus and make disciples? Is it a goal that will get you through the difficult times as well as the good times? Because there are going to be setbacks in life. There are going to be pains. There are going to be failures. It's going to happen. And he's saying, listen, you've got to keep your eye on what is ahead. Just like Jesus, you've got to keep your eye on that marker at the end of the field. If you're going to plow a straight line, you've got to press on towards the goal to win. You want to make it through those difficult times and they're going to happen, you've got to stand bold and you've got to stand firm on understanding who you are, why you exist, what your purpose is, and what it means to win. And that's tough. The last thing I want to remind you of and this is so important. If you're struggling with something in your past, if you're stuck like we saw in that diagram, maybe you're part of that 80%. Maybe there's some things from your past. Maybe it's shame. Maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's just hurt. Maybe it's failure. We all got them. But I got to ask you this big question. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive in your life? Because I have found this one thing is the biggest obstacle for people moving forward in their lives. They struggle with forgiving themselves. They struggle with forgiving someone else. Maybe you even struggle with forgiving God. Who do you need to forgive in your life? Because here's the problem. If you genuinely want to grow, if you genuinely want to become emotionally and spiritually mature, and that is my hope, that you want to do that, understand this, though, as you pray more and you ask for God's help, the first thing God's going to ask you is to forgive somebody or to forgive something in your life, to do the difficult act of forgiving, no matter how bad or how vicious the wrong may have been. God's going to expect you to wrestle and deal with it and to forgive. And so I ask the question, who do you got to forgive? What do you have to forgive in your life that's keeping you stuck where you are? That 80% we talked about, this forgiveness thing, that's something you have to surrender. You have to surrender your right to hold on to this thing. You have to surrender your right to justice when the Bible says justice belongs to the Lord. You're going to have to surrender and you're going to have to forgive. And you're going to have to do the hard work of forgiving. And it is hard work. It is painful. It isn't easy. But when you do the hard work of truly forgiving, when you do the hard work of letting them go, the 
Holy Spirit can enter your life if you ask and heal you in a way that you could never imagine. But you've got to take the first step. You've got to do the work and you've got to start forgiving. So who do you got to forgive in your life? You say, I'm stuck. I'm plateaued. I don't feel like I'm growing. What haven't you surrendered? Who haven't you forgiven? What do you got to do? What's your next step? Again, I'd love to tell you that Christianity is all about God waving his magic wand and saying, you're healed. But it is a partnership between us and God, and he often expects us to take first steps in that to show that we have the discipline and to show that we have the desire. And this first step is yours. Who or what do you need to forgive in your past? Because I don't want us to be stuck we need to be growing we need to be surrendering we're not meant to stay where we are take a moment and close your eyes if you would right where you're at in this moment of pause reflect Where is forgiveness needed? Who do you need to forgive? Is it you? We all struggle with forgiving ourselves. But if God forgives you as far as the east is from the west, why don't you forgive yourself? Are you God? Maybe you need to forgive someone else. And you're saying, you don't know what they did, Jason. You don't know what they said. You don't know how they hurt me. I don't. I don't. What I do know is that if you don't forgive them, you're going to be stuck. And you think you're hurting them, but you're really just hurting yourself. you got to let them go. Justice belongs to the Lord, not you. Forgive them and allow God's Holy Spirit and his grace and his love and his mercy to fill you in such a way that he can help heal those wounds. He can help you see opportunity where you see saw obstacles and he can help you grow beyond it to be even better than anything you ever imagined. Yes, we have to walk through pain in this lifetime in order to grow. But the point of walking through that pain is you got to forgive and you got to let it go. If you want God to work powerfully in your life, forgiveness starts with you. Stop playing God.